Um, so welcome again, everyone. Hey, um, I'm Shani Mears, and I'm just going to be sort of facilitating the conversation with these wonderful peeps. Um, just a quick intro to myself. I'm an advertising professional working across lots of different things and also a lecturer at Kingston University. Um, a lot of my work is around access and representation and also community manager at She Said So, which is an organisation for um, women and non-binary individuals in music and lots of different things. So, I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves, um, but today we're going to be talking about 50-50 gender lineups and just gender disparities in general, um, looking at music and I suppose, yeah, just the creative industry as a whole. I think it's good to have like an open perspective on how we look at the whole industry, so it'll be good to get everyone's perspectives and please um, ask questions as we go. I think it's important to have a wider conversation as well, but yeah. I'm going to hand it over to Wada, who is to the left of me. OK, shall I just get this? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, brilliant. Um, <laughs> my name is Wada Sampa, and um, hold on, let me just get comfortable. <laughs> there you go. Do you want me to take Can it? Can I just grab yeah, it? Let yeah. me just grab it, yeah. <laughs> Um, hi guys, that was a bit awkward. Um, my name is Wada Sampa and I am the editor of Link Up TV. Recently left, I was with them for five years. Um, I am the ambassador for Women in Control um, and I do a lot of like panels and stuff with that and events and stuff like that with them. And also I got a new role at Universal Music Polydor, so I'll be doing like their R&B and rap roster, which is cool. Thank you, right on. Um, hi, I'm Maxi. Um, I am currently the European project manager at Secretly Group. Um, I've only been there for three weeks, um, so another new role. Um, but before that, for five years, I worked with Joe at PRS Foundation. Um, and for two of those five years, I worked as project manager for Key Change, which is a, um, an international movement for gender equality in the music industry. Um, so it's a talent development program for 74 women and gender minorities on an annual basis um, and also a pledge that music organisations can sign up to um, to achieve um, greater um, parity um, in their organisation. Hi guys, I'm Alex. I am a live music promoter at Live Nation and Metropolis Music. Um, I deal with like tours, concerts, festivals. I also run a not-for-profit organisation called Women Connect and we're just all about improving the lives for women, non-binary and gender non-conforming people in the music industry. Cool, and I'm Joe. I'm Chief Exec at PRS Foundation. So we're a funder of new music and talent development. Um, we support music creators, so songwriters, composers, artists, producers um, who work in any genre, anywhere in the UK. Um, and we have a particular focus on filling talent pipeline gaps and breaking down barriers. So my predecessor was uh, a great chief exec called Vanessa Reed, who's moved, moved to America. She set up a fund called Women Make Music nearly 10 years ago. And Key Change, which Maxi just introduced, was kind of um, one of the things that we built off the back of Women Make Music findings. Um, and we kind of combine open programs that music creators and organizations can apply to with really targeted programs like Key Change. Amazing, thank you. Um, so just to get, again, a, a wider perspective and maybe just observations around the gender disparity when it comes to, like, male um, lineups and festivals and stuff, like, what is, what's your opinion so far? Because I know that there was a lot of uproar when um, Wireless had obviously released their, um, their lineup, but that was online and that was the first time I was saying to Alex, the first time I've seen something like that like go so viral. But I know that obviously over the course of a long time, it kind of has been that. So in terms of just your own observations, what do you feel like is one happening, but then equally like positively happening since? Oh, shall I go first? Yeah. Are we doing this order thing or is it just going to be No, no, yeah, just any, anyone. I'm kind of um, looking here because you're to the left yeah, of me, but of anyone please interject. Um, I feel like it's kind of evident there's so much that we need to do. Um, what hurts me is when I'm speaking to my friends that are artists and they're saying to me, there's only two artists that are in the lineup and there's so many males. And this has been going on for so, so long. I feel like it's getting better where women are speaking up on social media, which is amazing. And I'm seeing, you know, different... Um, platforms that are focused to helping women, upcoming women, artists, behind the scenes and stuff like that, which is amazing. But I think we still have a long way to go. But I think it's so evident you can see it. Mm. It's a male-dominated industry, which is a shame. But I feel like we are slowly moving forward. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I think um, 
festivals unfortunately get a lot of the um, a lot of the criticism because it's like it's so public. Um, like every year you have that poster, which is quite easy to kind of spot the disparity on. Um, and yeah, we, we've seen at, in my time at Key Change, we saw a lot of those posts go viral where you kind of blank off the men on the lineup and it's basically an empty poster. Um, and I think that like it's it's definitely a kind of talent pipeline problem where um, women, women or bands with women and gender minorities in them or just artists um, kind of um, experience that kind of glass ceiling and you see women and gender minority artists kind of playing at that same level and not progressing in the same way as, as their male counterparts. So I, I think it's definitely like a kind of um, a, a representation problem, but it's also a development problem where kind of, um, yeah, that women and gender minorities are not allowed to progress in the same ways. Um, and I, I think it's across the music industry, it's not just music festivals. I think it's like um, behind the scenes in studios, in music organizations. And yeah, at, at Key Change, we have our pledge, which basically encourages festivals to book 50% women and gender minority artists. Um, and we have over 150 UK festivals signed up to that. Um, so every year they commit to progress. So there are festivals like Wild Pass as well, who are, who are a key change signatory, um, who are committing to change, taking responsibility and proactively um, booking from an equal talent pool, because that's the point. They're, they're, the talent is there. Mm. Yeah, definitely, I agree. I think. Um... There's, there's a really long way to go, but I've finally seen the switch. Like, I feel like last year with the uproar of, like, certain lineups um, really kind of made a difference with social media and everyone having to, like, just be accountable for what they're doing. So there's, I mean, there's organisations like the F-List, for example, which is a female directory of um, musicians in the UK, and it's so easy and accessible for festival bookers and um, event organisers and promoters to kind of gain access to and really just book female talent. So yeah, I agree with everything that you guys have said. It's, I mean, there's a long way to go, but the change is happening. We're definitely going in order. Yeah. <laughs> I think, um, obviously, my perspective and background's a bit different, and I, th I think, you know, like checking privilege, it's probably something I wasn't thinking about 10 years ago before I worked at PRS Foundation. Um, you know, I used to book a festival not dissimilar to Wild Paths up in Newcastle, and we wouldn't really talk about the gender balance when we were making decisions. And I think things have come so far to the point that the audience and the artist community and the wider music industry are the ones that are pointing out the underrepresentation and they're up in arms. And I think that much like in the last panel, we talked about how COVID impact the way people see things and have reflected. Some of the outcry in the last six, seven months has been because everyone spoke about building back better and how good it would be to return to live. And some of the lineups just were not built back better at all. Um, and, and I think some of it feels empty, but the positives are there are hundreds of organizations pledging to do better. Mm -hmm. There are lineups that are either equal already or much closer to equal. And even those lineups where it's it's not strong, it's a conversation point. So I've, I've been in the room where you have um, bookers of festivals really tearing their hair out or like comparing notes, seeing how it's going. And they might not have signed a pledge, they might not be close to 50%, but it's a conversation point. And I, I think it's come so far that if you are a festival booker and you're announcing your festival tomorrow and you know that the lineup's not bad, you have to be ready to make yourself accountable and to answer those questions. And I, I think, you know, from a key change perspective, we're part of that conversation, but we're about encouraging the positive steps and saying, like, here's what happens when you do it. Like, it's a much better festival. It's well attended. Like, let's debunk all the myths about um, whether you'll sell tickets or not if you have a gender equal lineup um, and just push the positives of it. Um, and, and I, I think Maxi kind of touched upon the fact festivals are the ones where they announce a lineup. It's very visible, whether it's balanced or not. Um, award shows like the Brits or the Mercury's, that's the same thing. So that's kind of like the marker each year. Um, but there are so many different solutions and it's complex. But, but yeah, I feel like festivals need to be part of it because 
if you're a 14 year old woman or gender minority artist coming through, seeing that Billie Eilish is gonna headline Glastonbury is gonna inspire you and tell you that festivals are there for you. And, and that's why I think it's really important that a festival has that representation at every bit of their lineup because it's about that next generation and welcoming more people basically. I also think it's really different in different countries as well. Like in Canada, it's not, I mean, the, it, to talk about just gender is kind of behind the times. It, it's so, so important to focus on intersectionality. I think we are getting there in the UK with that, but um, then you go to like France and Italy where perhaps it's a bit behind the UK. So it's yeah. quite different in different countries as well, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I was gonna to touch on that in terms of like intersectional because I think Oh, well, and again, this is coming from a perspective of working in advertising. It's often spoke about in siloed, like gender payback, but I'm like, you can't talk about the gender pay gap if you're not going to talk about the black and Asian minority payback. So it's like, how how important is it, like, in terms of, like, behind the scenes? Um, I know that, for example, um, Alex, you do a lot with Women Connect, and you also, I think, you're the diversity lead. And so it's like, how important it is to do all those things in the background to make sure that there's a continuous push about talking about the intersections, whether it be race, whether it be gender, whether that be ability, sexuality. So how, how much do you feel like, you touched on it being the UK kind of getting there, but how much do you feel like it's happening? Like you can see like actively, even water with all the work that you're doing with Women in Control, like, like do you feel like, okay, this sort of movement and change that is happening, I can see that actually it's making us like a solid difference, even if it's a small difference, but it's a constant, do you know what I mean? I mean, all the small differences add up. Like a lot of people think they're just like a, a, like a pin drop and mm. what they do doesn't really matter and it's not really working. But I feel like the more effort that you make as an individual and, and within teams, the more difference it will make. So for, my, for example, like for myself, I started Women Connect because I was just seeing so many like people in my community just saying, okay, there's not enough opportunities or we don't have the budget to like do unpaid internships and all of that kind of stuff that just kind of impacts you and doesn't give you the accessibility or the kind of the resources that you need to progress in your career. I think doing all of these, like everybody who's sitting on the sofa, all of these little things that we do are actually quite big in the grand scheme of things. Like they really do make a difference to so even if it's just one individual's lives, like it makes a difference. Like if you help one person, you help five people, you, hence, you help 10. And a lot of people don't even realize that. I mean, for, for myself, like in my, the span of like my career over 10 years, I think now is the only time that I've really seen like a difference be made. And, and it's about having that open dialogue. Like if we don't talk about it, the problem doesn't get solved. And I think a lot of people shy away from having that conversation. So even like being here today is a, such a great thing. Yeah, amazing. And I have to add to that as well, and um, talking about pay gaps as well. Like us women weren't talking about how much they were getting paid. Mm. And I don't know why it's been fed into us since young where we, women are just awkward in talking about pay. Yeah. Like, but now with Women in Control, we have like groups and seminars where we talk about like, how much do you really get paid though? Mm. Or like even guys get involved as well and they'll be like, okay, I get paid this. So we've got the same roles, but he's getting paid more than me. And I think it's so amazing that there's platforms like yourselves and Women in Control and loads more where we can talk about these things because mm. they need to be talked about. Yeah, no, definitely. And you touched on it, Joel, um, privilege and spoke about how you wasn't really thinking about that. But how much now in terms of what all of what PRS are doing, and I know that they like do funds for like new artists and stuff like that, how much do you consider all those like steps in terms of the intersectionalities? Um, and, and I don't know how the necessarily the application process works, but um, if they say putting forth a, a number and you know you just said water, women will probably put a little bit less than when a male artist does, like how much does PRS then take accountable to be like, oh actually like, you know, you can do X or what, like, what does that process look like? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I'm a bit of a stats geek. So before I was chief exec, I was in the grants team. So like I, I was quite obsessed by those differences and the observations and the intersectionality of it. And I think um, it's something we could probably talk about a bit more. Like we're an inclusive funder. So we are considering barriers being faced by underrepresented talent when they're applying. And, and that would mean things like when we're making a funding decision between two artists, you're trying to think, well, what might be blocking this artist from being at the same level of, pro of progress to this artist? Who's, who's going to do the most with the money? Who's this going to have the biggest impact for? And ultimately, we're a charity, so we are there to serve people who need that funding support and they need that talent development support. So 
it's all factored in. I think kind of inspired by everything Vanessa learned through Women Make Music, you can apply some of it to other areas. And that, for example, is making sure we would never have a decision panel with four white guys from London who all work in indie music. And that's probably something other funders have been guilty of in the past. So if you were to witness one of our decision panels, you'd see how representative it is, or you know, at least we'd, we're making a conscious effort to do that. Um, and that plays into the decisions that are being made. And, and interestingly on, on intersectionality, we've definitely found where we're making a conscious effort to target one barrier, it has a positive impact on the others. So key change, for example, we just had a, a massive deadline for year two of the talent development program, had nearly 600 applicants. They're all women and gender minority artists and innovators, but over 42%, that's a stats geek in me coming out, um, are from LGBTQIA plus communities. So like that's a huge stat, but I think to us it shows that we're being inclusive in one area and inclusive in others. Um, however, we've got loads more work to do, like the key change partners are very white European. Um, we need to connect a lot more with different intersectional groups and make improvements there. But they're kind of examples of like, once you start down that path as a funder, you learn a lot about what does work, what doesn't work. You learn to make sure that you build authentic connections with different communities. Um, and that's, we spend a lot of time talking about this. Like I, I think it's one of the, the best things about working at the foundation and the best thing about our team is we spend so much time talking about it because we're so passionate about seeing it happen. Um, and I, I think it just, whether as an applicant you realize it or not, it has a positive impact on the decisions. Um, and, and I think it just means our, our default is always, how can we make an improvement in that area? Um, what do we need to do? And, and I guess the difficulty is we then have like 15, 16 different funding programs because we're trying to be inclusive in as many areas as we can. But we just think that's better than having like one fund that anyone can apply to that mm. isn't working in that area so sorry that's taken way way more time than you probably no, thought no, it's but yeah we, we, we talk about it a lot and, and hopefully it's making a difference i think i think that's i think that's good and i think i don't know who mentioned it but someone said something about open dialogue is so important and that constant conversation about understanding where you're doing really well but then equally pointing out the points where you said obviously we still have a lot of work to do in that sort of white european space and with the partners etc but that also brings me on to the next question around like transparency and as a whole, like how how important is it for, from you guys' perspective, like to be transparent? Because with everything with COVID, for example, I know that women were a lot more likely to lose their jobs, redundancies, and particularly this is around like the creative industry. And then again, we spoke about not wanting to ask for more in comparison to like make their male counterparts. So as organizations or as people running organizations, how important is it to have those open conversations around like, you know, our board doesn't look the way it's supposed to be or um, like we're very London centric, how about going here? Or, you know, who's in our audience? The seat at the table report was really good for that. Like the 12 music trade bodies being open about knows um, female black mm -hmm. CEOs and like you know like how important is that transparency in terms of making that I suppose that progress I mean I, I guess I'm kind of happy to start on that yeah. and then let everyone yeah, else properly take over but um I think it's really crucial I think it's it's quite difficult for some people to do and like Lots of my fellow funding CEOs are white guys like me. Um, lots of trade associations are run by white guys. So we, we, we talk about these things, but the transparency side is key because it's saying, you know, we recognize there's an issue here. Like in, in my company, we didn't have enough, well, we didn't have anyone in the senior team who wasn't white British, for example. So we'd be really transparent about that and then connect with as many people as we can so that we can address it. Um, but I, I think it's, it kind of depends on the size of organization you're in and there's lots of different factors, but the transparency is key because you can say, well, actually we do have a gender pay gap. We do have an ethnicity pay gap. It's here, you should make us accountable and ask us next year what it is. Um, and that's happening a bit more. Um, 
but but I, I think it's it's probably like the first crucial step to making sure that a company can change is that you're transparent, you publish the data, you publish the info, and then you come to events like this and you talk about it, and then you talk among um, your peers about what needs to change, and and you should just be willing to be challenged on it, as in like. I can say that we have a gender pay gap at PRS Foundation of something like 10%, um, and that's the mean pay gap, and I want people to challenge me and say, well, why is that? Um, what are you gonna do about it? And I think that's, um, it's key. And, th and then you have to follow that transparency up with a target and publish your target. And um, I guess, because we work in the nonprofit world, we're a bit more used to that than say, a record label would be, or a, a promoter or a festival would be. I think transparency is really key. I think it shows an element of care. So if you don't speak about these things, how, how is the difference going to be made? And, and the people at the, the top of these companies, I guess it's been so long that they've been working in a particular way. So sometimes it can be hard and people are stuck in their ways and it's really hard to process change. But also at the same time, why shouldn't people be paid fairly and why shouldn't we speak about our salaries and, and why shouldn't we have these, these like I said earlier, like an open dialogue? Because if nothing shady is happening, then it shouldn't matter that people are speaking about these things and trying to make a difference and improve everyone's lives. Like at Women Connect, we, we recognise that a lot of our events were just London focused and it just, like, there's the whole of the UK that we can potentially explore, so it was good for us to kind of be held accountable and, and try and do something for people outside of London, so that's one of the things I've kind of taken on board, like, in recent years, I, I need to hold myself accountable and um, have these conversations and be transparent, that's the type of person I want to be. Yeah, totally, uh, to follow on from what they're both saying, I, like, I think individually, I always try to acknowledge that I'm on a, a journey of understanding and listening and collaboration. So, like, I'm really proud that in my time at Key Change, I've collaborated with She Said So, Women in Control, Women Connect, and many other organisations to kind of to make sure that it's not just like, okay, this, there's one way to do inclusivity, and it's my way. That's not that's not going to um, that's not going to equal progress in the long run. Um, but I also think like transparency is important, but I think organizationally process is really important. So it's okay to kind of like, yeah, like you were saying, it's okay to talk about things, but you need, you need systems in place so that people can report things that go wrong, report when they're not happy, report instances um, of harassment, abuse, discrimination. Um, so you're not just highlighting the, pro the problem, you're dealing with it as well. There's, there's not going to be a kind of perfect organisation where nothing bad happens and there's no inequality at all. Like, we're, we're kind of constantly navigating this kind of um, systemic racism, systemic sexism, um, and we have to acknowledge that that's there and put processes in place to deal with it and try to stop it wherever we can. So, yeah, I, I think process is really important. And um, in my short time at Secretly Group, it's... it's um, I'm. I've been really, really amazed to see the processes that are in place in um, not just kind of charitable organizations like PRS Foundation, I've worked at for five years, but in record labels and stuff too. And this is one of the reasons why I love Women in Control. Um, <laughs> because they're posting, from now on moving forward, we're gonna be posting reports every single year in terms of the pay gaps in labels in record labels and the sexism and stuff like that. So that's what I'm saying, you were talking about process and like process, I think it's super, super, super important to kind of just be like, okay, well, this year, this is the percentage, next year, have we seen any changes? And kind of just call people out about it. Yeah, and I think that's what then becomes a ripple effect, right? To like the lineups and stuff, because the more all those things in the background, those things are happening, those systems that become in place and people are feel more empowered to call out and um, all the stuff that's happening internally, then they can, when they're making those decisions about lineups or any like sort of artist performances and venues having more women and non-binary individuals in their spaces, it feels a lot more like, okay, I can talk about this. Like I feel more confident and the artists will feel supported. So back to that, how do you feel like, I suppose, taking more steps forward for people who are, and this is just, I'm gonna just, put, I'm gonna assume that people in the audience might wanna know this. I don't know if you guys work in festival lineups and stuff, but how do you feel like if you are um, for yourself who was 10 years ago in that room making those decisions, what are those questions that you need to ask yourself to hold yourself as an individual to be accountable for the questions like, you know, are we thinking about this fairly? 
who are these people, where are they from, etc. Like, what what would you say? How do you hold yourself accountable as an individual when you aren't making those decisions? Uh, I think it depends whether you're paying attention to it in the first place or not. Like, hopefully, let's assume you're a festival booker who is paying attention to it, and you need to think about how this looks when you have your main announcement or how it looks when you have your first initial announcement. And this is one of the nuances, I think, of the last year is some of the festivals announced their return and they announced their first phase lineup and it was, say, like 80% men, 20% not men. Um, and I think it's that conscious decision that you're representing your festival, you're representing a scene, if it's a particular genre or a city, um, and that first announcement should be as balanced as it can be, um, or it should try to reflect what your final lineup's gonna look like. And I think it's that, um, just the conscious effort to check it and to make sure that it's improving year on year. And I, th I think with something like a key change pledge, when it was initially launched by the festivals involved in it, like Reaper Barn Festival and Talent Music Week, they were saying, well, it's 2017 now, coming into 2018, by 2022, we want our festivals to have 50% representation. Um, and that wasn't saying in the next year it's gonna be 50%. Like they consciously had to like take that step, five, 10% each per year. And I think that approach is really important. And it comes down to the, what Maxi just said about transparency and process. It is, you know, by 2028, I want my festival to be balanced or I want better representation in any area. So let's change it by 5% or 10% each year. And I think, that has to be the thought process is like, when we announce this festival, um, how's this gonna look? Is this a representation that we can get behind and be proud of? Is this gonna encourage more people to come to our event? Um, and I, I think that's part of the change that has happened as people are thinking about that a bit more. Um, the other nuance I'd add to that is like, where on the lineup is someone? Because there are lots of events who, and this is not necessarily the worst thing in the world, but they might be close to 50% representation, but they're all on a particular stage or they're all on a particular part of the lineup and it's not at the the higher level like the headline level and i think that will take even longer to get to that point but it's really important that that is reflected in each bit of communication i think yeah i think it can be really simple like who is not in the room and why and like as a festival it can that can mean so many things like do we have parents um what is our what are our access um, specifications like? I think you can always ask yourself those questions, and it's about challenging yourself and saying we can always do better. And I mm. think that's really important. Thank you. Anyone, do you guys want to? Yeah, I, yeah oh. I was going to agree. Like it's it's about who's in the room, and I've I've noticed in like the last few years, people are wising up a little bit and saying, okay, we need more junior staff in the room as well, because sometimes when you're at the top, you're a little bit far removed from what's actually going on, even like with social media and um, just seeing how people interact with like the, the announcements of different festival lineups and events and all of that kind of stuff. Like if you're not part of that world, sometimes you miss it and it goes over your head and you think it's, oh, it's great. Like everything looks great. But the people who are actually on the ground and they have their ear to the floor, like understand that, okay, this isn't being perceived in the best way possible. So it's, it's really about who's in the room and trying to make sure that you can include as many people as possible. Yeah, yeah, I definitely hear that on the who's in the room in terms of like junior and there's there's also something to be said about that in general though, right? In terms of like senior stakeholders feeling like they are the stakeholders in that space when there are a lot of junior and mid staff who can contribute so much value to those conversations simply because of the cultures they're a part of or the, even the generation that they're just a part of. And I think a lot of um, organisations are kind of getting there, but again, I think it's a process and the other, the other panel touched on it a bit about that gatekeeping mentality and breaking away from like, a lot of those like, systems. Um, I know we're kind of like on time, but not on time, but we do have like an open conversation for panels and um, for the questions. So have you guys got any questions for the panel at all? Two, okay, go for you first and then at the back. My question is about um personal and individual safety in spaces like festivals. Um, so you can, when you make something inclusive or equitable, doesn't there need to be a really another conversation about what existing in those spaces means? And do the panel have thoughts about 
how to ensure that women and gender minorities are truly safe and comfortable and accommodated in boardrooms and C-suites in at festival spaces and things like that. So beyond just getting the, the representation boots on the floor, beyond that. Yeah, great question. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that there are different kind of strategies and responses to that. So like, I think that in the creative Europe language of key change, we talk about gender mainstreaming a lot, which um, basically just means having um, women and gender minorities at all levels of decision making so that um, um, decisions are made with gender in mind. Because, I mean, there's the famous book, Invisible Women, um, which um, talks a lot about um, um, cars and um, um, road systems um, having a huge kind of gender implication. And so there are things that you don't even think about when you're making decisions that are actually quite gendered. Um, and so I think that having um, women and gender minorities um, and just diversity in all positions means that decisions about safety, like security, um, safe spaces, what that actually means, um, perhaps like having a crash at a festival, for example, might be considered if, um, if women and gender minorities were, um, were part of those, that decision making. So I think that's, that's one um, strategy, but then also, um, again, I'll go back to process and putting systems in place so that you, you are safeguarding. So um, not just crashes, but could, could you have a safe area or a kind of crisis area at a festival? Um, so you're kind of um, responding, you're trying to prevent these things from happening, but also providing solutions for responding to um, any um, aspects of safety if that does arise. Anyone else? I just um, so a really good example that is kind of um, shows what can be done is strawberries and cream. So that's a, a festival run in Cambridge, and this year they partnered with Girls I Rate. And if you don't know Girls I Rate, um, please check them out. But Carla Marie Williams is the founder. Um, she worked with the strawberries and cream team to make sure that their lineup was representative and intersectional. But they went a bit further, so they collaborated with Girls I Rate, a little bit with Key Change, and also with UN Women and Sustainability Development Goals um, to create that safe space that Maxi spoke about. So that, to me, is an example of a festival going even further to say, like, not just will the lineup be representative, but here's what our process is for artists, here's what they're going to experience when they get here, mm -hmm. and if within the audience and the fans um, there are any issues when it comes to harassment or worse um then here's the safe space here's our guidance and I, I think that's really important and i'm guessing if you're an artist deciding whether to play a festival or not that might be a key factor um and then you get into things like inclusivity riders um and just making it really clear as a festival organizer what would happen if any of these things go wrong um and kind of what to expect when you show up um and this comes up quite a lot as you know you might be a woman artist but what's the experience like in that venue is there a green room is there a changing room are the toilets accessible like all, all of these things like i feel like the live sector is developing really good practice in this area to kind of say here's what you should expect when you get here this is what it's going to be like and and that that i hope kind of like answers that point um but it is quite rare i don't know of many festivals that have gone as far as those guys who run it did yeah, no, and Norwich Arts Centre is a great example for an accessible venue and gender neutral toilets. Love it. <laughs> Shout out Norwich. <laughs> um, I was also going to say to that as well. Some, uh, Alex, I think you said like the transparency shows like the level of care. And I think personal safety for my, in my own opinion, is also very personal, like how I choose to feel safe and be safe around certain people. So sometimes it's also about appointing different individuals to communities or groups of people because there's a lot of like there's a lot of talk about like you know um I only feel comfortable about around a woman right like do you know what I mean or I only feel comfortable around a, a black woman who can speak to me about this certain problem so I think it's also about understanding 
the types of people that can address certain safety issues and elements for those people's experiences because there's so many different touch points of before you even get to the festival. So I think, yeah, that's also something to think about on a wider aspect. Um, oh, okay. Same, same question. Any more questions um, around anything? No? Okay. Um, I mean, do you guys want to sort of leave with any final thoughts around if it just about um, gender disparity around intersectionality around progress in terms of people being able to make sort of system changes and processes do you guys have any final thoughts that you'd want to share with the audience um so I'll, I'll start um I feel like we've got so we still got so long to go like so we've got so much that we need to do and stuff like that but I think panels like this helps as well because you get an insight. Like, I didn't know that you guys were collaborating with all these amazing platforms because then it teaches me to think, okay, cool, maybe Link Up TV, which is a male-dominated platform, could post about something like that and let their followers know that this is what's going on. So I think panels like this help. I think a lot of these platforms shouting and screaming about it on social media help as well. But I think we're getting there slowly. I think this is the best time it's been. I can't lie to you. It's the best time it's been. Um, but yeah, I think we've still got a long way to go. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, um, I, I would just say, like, um, the way that I think about it is about responsibility and accountability. And so, like, think about what you can do. Like, we can all make a difference. Um, I feel very lucky to have grown up in the Norwich music scene, so I've always been surrounded by strong um, women and gender minority role models and amazing music that um, kind of um, was accidentally kind of posit like positive in its kind of representation, but maybe it was um, n not as accidental as I thought. Anyway, um, yeah, create, like you can create your own positive action in your own world, your own music communities, um, and in your own um, professional environment too. So um, think about what responsibility and accountability you can kind of take action on. Um, I would like to just encourage people to speak up more and reach out to like festival organisers and bookers and people who are involved in events, promoters, all of that kind of um, people behind the scenes in live music and just express how you feel and how we can improve these events. Like I'd love to speak to people here if they have any suggestions for how maybe we can make tours safer for women and gender minority people and just um, all of that stuff. Like, I just really want to hear more. So if there's anyone here that has any suggestions, I'd love to kind of speak to you after. Cool. And I feel like in the same way that everyone benefits from a better connected sector, like everyone needs to take a bit of responsibility for it. So I've been in rooms where we're talking about festival lineups and the festival will blame the agent who blames the manager who blames the record labels for not signing enough who blames the fact there's not enough grassroots support like it's kind of like this cycle and i feel like everyone needs to say well we're a part of this like we're all a part of um achieving that goal the end goal so here's what i'm going to do this year or here's what i'm going to do in the next five years to make it better and, and i think um that's where the conversation about festival lineups has got a lot better, is that people are starting to say, well, actually, like, it isn't just the festival booker's fault that the lineup's not right, but they want to do something about it. The labels are more conscious of it now, so let's work with the labels. Let's, um, let's kind of fix it at each of those steps so we, we can kind of stop just going in a circle because that's... Um, that is really frustrating. Yeah, yeah how that nobody. makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. And also on that note, um, check out She Said So, Women in Control, read the report, Key Change, Women Connect, all the PRS stuff that they've got, all their fundings, and yeah, put someone on even if it's not for you. And um, thank you, Wildpaths. Yeah.